His love and His faithfulness and His Spirit living within us, enabling us and helping us, we cannot rise to the occasion and do the work that we've been called to do. It's impossible. We're going to continue um, from where we were last week with contemplating worthwhile work in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. And we're going to kind of look at this and, and, and just review very quickly our understanding of this command and then our response congregationally to the command and then our response individually in, in this command. And, and so there's a, a, a short video clip I want us to look at. at how do we respond congregationally? What, what does that look like? And individually, what are we, what's the scriptures calling us to do? So if you'll go ahead and show that, please. interesting way to look at church. Nothing wrong with gathering together to praise and to worship and to exalt the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but no less important, to live as we've been called to live. To go out and be a part of people's lives, people that we meet day to day, and bring gospel conversations and gospel light to people that are in darkness and that are in many times hopeless and sometimes helpless. That's what we're going to look at today. So at the beginning, I want to just, if you weren't, were not here uh, last week, I want to, to just briefly review uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. It says, so then my dear brothers and sisters, Stand firm, do not let anything move you, always give yourselves completely to the work of the Lord, because you belong to the Lord, you know that your work is not worthless. So three things we looked at last week. One, um, our understanding of the command here gives us insight into our responsibilities and uh, the command itself. When he says, so then, my dear brothers and sisters, he's greeting his kinsmen, his fellow laborers, for the last time with this greeting. And the greeting that he used here for, for my dear brothers and sisters is agapetos. And you obviously hear the word agape in that, in that greeting. This is obviously the most unconditional and paramount love that we see in the scriptures. 
Agape describes perfect love, the kind of love that Jesus Christ had for his father and that he had for his followers. And this is the same kind of love that Paul had for those that he had labored with. I think it's significant that we engage our community with this type of love. We have to have this type of love in our minds and in our hearts in order for us to love the way Christ did and the way that Paul did these believers. This love must be deep-rooted. It can't be just a, a, a compassion, although that's good. It, it can't be just something that we have uh, feelings for others, that we, we pity them. For us to be involved in people's lives, it has to be this type of commitment. It has to be this type of love. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you were my disciples, if you have love one for another. This is the exact type of love that the world will be able to identify that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Same word used here. This type of love is selfless. It's sacrificial. And it's unconditional. So the love that drove Christ to the cross to voluntarily lay down his life for us is the same love that we must have for each other and for our neighbors. Any other type of love or affection will not cause us to lay down our preferences or even our rights, selflessly, sacrificially love someone else, whether they're here a part of this congregation or, or not. This is the only love that is strong enough to make this church and my life not about me. Any other kind of love will focus more on me. This love demands that it be about Christ. Paul also said that we are able to, or that we are to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. After telling his readers not to, to move in any way from their confidence in the resurrection, Paul encourages them to excel in the Lord's work. And we saw last week that this builds. It is not, we're not just to do the work of the Lord, but we're to abound in the work of the Lord, and we're to always abound in the work of the Lord. So this kind of, to me, comes down to, at all times, do more than enough work of the Lord. We describe this work of the Lord as sharing the gospel and growing in truth and grace. In doing the work of the Lord. Loving and edifying others. And Paul says that we should do this knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Such labor given freely in service to the Lord is never in vain because the Lord himself blesses his servants. And you will reap an eternal reward. It is all profitable. Our labor will bear fruit either in this life or the life to come, but it will not be in vain. This is the promise to every laborer in the Lord's vineyard. The resurrection is proof and down payment of a reward. Now that we've kind of reviewed this a commandment, let's look at our response congregationally to doing the work of the Lord. In the past several years, uh, we've experienced uh, a lot of change here. Our culture has changed around us, and we have changed. There are several, th several things that have happened uh, recently that are not a, were a part of our lives a few years ago. Under our pastor's leadership, he has directly and indirectly influenced several key aspects of life at Bethel. And if you'll go ahead and go to that next slide, these are just some of the things that I thought of. Our guiding documents, the Constitution and bylaws and confession of faith that clearly outline what do we believe and what do we stand for and what do we live for. And then also um, the covenant that we read every month. Recommitting ourselves and renewing ourselves to each other and to God in our labor here together as a congregation. Community presence, a monthly 
uh, prayer at City Hall and ministers gathering to pray of all denominations and faith. Local missions, connecting with our neighbors uh, in Brookwood Apartments right next door to us. Picnics here and at the park. A better understanding of the demographics around us. Who are the people that live around us? We didn't have a real good grasp on that, and I'm not sure we have a great grasp on it, but we know more about them now than we have before. Owasso Ministerial Alliance meeting. Thanksgiving baskets. Mission Owasso, Hope Crisis Pregnancy. Pregnancy Resource Center. An open table restaurant here in town that feeds anyone who comes in at no cost. And if you want to pay, you can pay. Global missions. We have now engaged in the work of the Lord in Indonesia on two occasions. China, Bulgaria, Mexico, and Haiti. That's different than life used to be here before. School of Prayer. We're gathering weekly to pray as a congregation on Wednesday evenings. There is nothing more encouraging than to hear your brothers and sisters in Christ cry out to God. If you're not a part of that, come. Pray with us. Entry points into uh, Bethel, uh, guests that come in here. How do they connect here? Several opportunities for teachers to hone their skills and to better connect and to better communicate God's word. Uh, the latest of these was uh, uh, yesterday morning at Central Baptist. They hosted an event. Great host training. Here we discussed our commitment to serve and anticipate needs of others and, and to meet those needs of our guests. How do we do that? Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Weekly exegetical teaching of God's word faithfully. Here, evangelism training, faith, way of the master, life on mission. There isn't any one of these that's better or worse than the other, but there are different ways that we can have tools in our toolbox so that when we're conversing with people, we can pull things out and say, hey, here's, here's what Christ did for me. <laughs> here's what the gospel means to me. Here's how my life has changed. Welcoming those new into our community, life groups. Um, Acts 1-8 Church Growth Workshop. There we identified that we need to be more outward focused and that we also wanted to put our facility to use more. Sending. Two couples from our congregation are now serving in full-time cross-cultural missions. Guest speakers. And just a few that I thought of were uh, David Sitton, Conrad and Bayway. Joseph Son, Barack Mayaz, Bodie Bauckham, just to name some of the ones that I can remember. These pastors and teachers and preachers help us increase our awareness of the global church and what's going on outside of here. And all of these are good, but perhaps the most important change in life at Bethel has been our focus on disciple making. It's been said that the making of disciple is our Lord's means for answering the prayer, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In his infinite wisdom, Jesus has chosen to use dedicated followers, his disciples, to carry out his mission. The, the message of salvation to all people of the world. This next quote is convicting and it's disturbing at the same time. Neil Cole commented that ultimately each church will be evaluated by only one thing, its disciples. Your church is only as good as its disciples. It does not matter how good your praise, preaching, programs, or property are, if your disciples are passive needy consumerists and not moving in the direction of radical obedience your church is no good now we could have discussions about the accuracy of this quote 
But my prayer is that as a congregation, we will desire to, above all, collectively be obedient to the command to go and make disciples and support that congregationally. To exhibit those characteristics and those traits in each other and to help us build each other up in doing this work. Next, let's turn our attention to our responsibilities individually. Our response individually should be that first, we have to be a disciple. <laughs> I can't make anyone a, or encourage or help or influence anyone to be a disciple of Christ if I am not one. I could make them a disciple of me, but I cannot make them a disciple of Christ. So our first response is that we have to be a disciple, and then our second response is we must be a disciple maker. Being a disciple maker is simply becoming more like Christ. And that's really easy to say. It's easy to remember. We could all quote that next week. <laughs> but my response individually is, so how am I doing? What does that look like in my life? I know that it means I need to act like Christ, but what does that mean I should be doing? What did we see Christ do in his life in the short time that he was here? What was important enough in his life that we see him doing? He, after all, is our model. Well, one of the things that we see him doing, we see him spreading the good news. These evangelism training events have just been tools that we can use to help us get comfortable in doing that, whether it's on the doorstep or you're on a bus ride or you meet someone in a grocery store. I was in a grocery store with one of our ladies. Uh, our couples needed some help getting some groceries on the way home. And there was a conversation that broke out right in front of me between these two ladies. And it wasn't just about groceries. It was about their lives. They were exchanging part of their lives. And lo and behold, Christ came up in that discussion. Prayer came up in that discussion. <laughs> so those things that we see Christ doing sharing the good news and the gospel, and then also giving his life to make disciples. Those are the things that we need to be doing. One thing that most people need in our society today is a relationship. We are more connected today than we've ever been, yet we're more lonely than we've ever been. So whatever we do, however we try to reach our community, we have to build relationships. This is one of the reasons that we started the life groups was to get us moving around different and going and attending different studies and being with different people. And, and ultimately the goal is for that to become outside of here into our community. That's its design. In generations past, it was safe to assume that people had some kind of a context for the gospel that they knew something of the scriptures and they believed something about God and, and about his holiness and, uh, and, and salvation and what does that mean? And it, it's not safe to assume that anymore with the culture that you're living in today. So how do we reach this generation? First, I think we have to listen. We, we need to begin engaging in conversation and just listen. Where are they in their understanding? If they've been to seminary, then it's fine for us to use words like justification and sanctification and, and on all those words that we know in Christian life. If they haven't been to church, then it's silly for us to use those words. They don't know what those words mean. So we need to listen and find out where are they right now in their spiritual journey and how do I begin connecting with them wherever they are. We must listen with an ear to discern what they understand or believe about the scriptures, God, repentance, faith. And then based on where they are, share with them the truth of scripture just as Jesus modeled when he was speaking with the Samaritan woman and Paul modeled when he spoke at 
Areagophus um, in Acts chapter 17. So how do we go about making disciples? Linda and I have set, it's been more than a year, just figuring out exactly what does that mean I need to do. So I wanted just to think through some questions, some very basic questions about what does this mean that I need to do and what does it mean that you need to do if we're going to take up this call to go and make disciples, this command that we've been given by our Lord. The first thing that kind of came to my mind was who is a disciple maker? Every disciple. So if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you are a disciple. Your mission is his mission, and that is to make sure that his name is known all around the world. Well, you may not be going all around the world, but God has placed you here. He does that. He, he places our boundaries and our limits and where we will live. He orders our steps day by day. So while I'm here living in this city, I need to be about this work. One of the things that's required of disciple makers is a willingness to be available. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's inconvenient. It could be annoying and it may require interruptions for you to be a part of somebody else's life. It likely will. <laughs> Are you willing? It requires patience. When we look at those who have gone before us, their bottom line was not the church machine that they were trying to build, but they have taken their hands off of that job, understanding that that is Jesus' job to build the church, and their job was to make disciples. So this may require an adjustment in our focus. Am I trying to build the church, or am I trying to make disciples? It seems like if we take care of the disciple part, the church would take care of itself, at least in some part. The next question is what? What do I need to do to be a disciple maker? I think the bottom line here is just to bring Jesus into our daily conversations and relationships. Let the power of the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ move in people's lives. Share the gospel. And you'll have to discipline yourself to do this. This is not something that we can kind of wait. Have, have, you, have you done that? You've gone to a, some type of um, uh, evangelistic training, and you decide, okay, so now the next time somebody asks me, how, do I, how am I supposed to be saved, I can tell them. <laughs> well, we need to be a little more intentional than that, because people may not just come up to you and even understand that they need Christ. All they may know is that they're hurting, they're at rock bottom, they're disenfranchised from their family, from their community. No one loves them. They may not even realize they have a purpose for living. That may be where they are, but they still need the gospel. They still need the power of Jesus Christ and the saving hope of salvation in their lives. So we're going to have to discipline ourselves to share the gospel, not to just wait for someone to ask, but intentionally engage in sharing Christ and his love and his life and how he's changed us in our conversations and relationships. Many such opportunities for evangelism will never take place if we wait for them to occur spontaneously. In addition with uh, a sharing life, we need to be intentional in our relationships. Certainly we are going to meet people as we live day to day. But there may be some people that you've been placed around that maybe are in your family, maybe that live beside you, that we need to be intentional about getting to know them. And this is not always easy either. For the last two years, Linda and I have planned that we're going to have a little ice cream social out in front of our house for our neighbors. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> 
And Linda said, do we need to try to, to do that again? Yes, we need, to, we need to keep trying to do this and we'll, until we've completed it. <laughs> and at least make sure that we know our neighbors' names and cell numbers or whatever else that we, information that we can exchange. So this may require some intentional relationships. And then walk alongside other disciples. We just can't do this without the accountability and encouragement of others. It's just too easy not to. <laughs> so to walk alongside other disciples means to grow toward maturity in Christ. It means to uh, equip the disciples and to teach others as well. So this kind of brings us to the next question of when. When am I supposed to have time to be a disciple maker? We've struggled with this. I think several years ago, we even kind of asked ourselves the question, what night should we do this on? <laughs> it isn't a night that you do. It's not an event. It isn't something that you, that you have to add into whatever your schedule is. Making disciples, at least the way we see it in Scripture, is as they went. So whatever you're doing today, we need to look for those opportunities and we need to engage people in conversations that could provide hope, provide peace for them. What's my schedule look like for tomorrow? Who will I come in contact with? Just by chance. <laughs> by God's providence, he's going to cross your path with someone else this week. A lot of people this week. There's an opportunity for making disciples. Either sharing with them, maybe they've never heard the story of God sending his son to die on the cross for all who would believe. They may never heard that before. It may be another brother or sister in Christ that really needs encouragement. Praying for people. So the when, interestingly enough, is just occurring day to day. Simply bringing Jesus into our normal everyday conversations. But disciple making doesn't just happen. Next, where? Where do I find someone to disciple? If you're on the edge right now and you're thinking, all right, I'm in. <laughs> I'm committed. I'm going to work on this. And you start looking around, you're like, well, who am I supposed to get connected with? Where am I supposed to find someone? Most of the answer to this where question, again, is just in the context of our daily lives. But when we look at our daily lives through the lens of being intentional about the gospel, everyday events of our lives become more than just ordinary tasks. They become eternally significant rhythms in your life that are teeming with gospel opportunities. Everything we do. Think about where you're going tomorrow. Lots of people. So when we think about where do you go and what do you do on a regular basis, here are just a few things that, that kind of cross my mind. And, and if you look at these, there's something that you'll notice about them. Finding a local bank representative and getting to know them. <laughs> that sounded weird to me. <laughs> but it's another person that God's put in my path today if I'm going to the bank. Be regular at your local farmer's market. Take a regular stroll at your local park. Take your dog on a walk, especially in your neighborhood. If you, for some reason, if you take a dog with you, there'll be conversation. Uh, the, dog, animals and babies, if you've got them with you, there'll be conversation. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. People will just start talking to you. You can start a blog if you're into that technical stuff. Have gospel discussions in public places where others can listen. 
Have you ever offered just to tell someone your testimony so that you can share the gospel with them? <laughs> Most of the time they'll listen because it's your experience. It's what's happened to you. Check your area for community service events. And, and by the way, um, in your bulletin, there's a segment called Serve the World. We're now connected in with the nonprofits in the, in the neighborhood and in the, in the city. And we're getting a listing of these things. Uh, is it month by month? Uh, throughout, you'll see it in your bulletin. So this is another way that we've learned to be connected to our community so that we can bring those things to our attention. And some of those things you may have a passion for or you may do. Owasoisms on Facebook is another way to kind of keep track of what's going on here in our city. Ask a local restaurant owner how you could bless their employees. I like to eat. <laughs> Wouldn't it be interesting just to start to getting to know some of the people that come to your table by name and ask them if you can pray for them. Sometimes they'll open up more than, than what you anticipated that they would. There was a young man I met in El Chico restaurant downtown in Tulsa and um, he, he, he shared with me that he had a friend that was diagnosed with cancer. So I told him that I was going to pray for him. And it was probably three months or so, uh, maybe four months before I went back to that restaurant. And I didn't remember his name, I didn't sit in his section, but I, I asked him how his friend was doing and he said, as of right now, he was cancer-free. What a great time to rejoice. I don't, I don't have an ongoing relationship with that person right now, but our paths crossed. Frequent the same gas station. Make an effort to get to know the workers there. Watch sporting events with other people in your city. These are just regular things that people do. Normal, everyday events. So while we're out doing our normal routine, look for someone hurting. Notice who you're speaking to or maybe who speaks to you. And then be ready to introduce them. Seize the moment to introduce them to Christ. Next question is how? How do I disciple someone? Once you've identified a person that just seems to be a part of your life, Maybe you've opened that door of an intentional relationship with them, or maybe they've asked. But once they've been identified, what do you do? One of the great resources is the real life discipleship that we went through about three or four years ago. If you still have that book, get it out. You can find it online. That's an excellent resource. Multiply is another good resource. But identify where they are in their spiritual journey and then help them to grow spiritually by spending time with them, by just showing what Christ looks like in your life. Why? To answer this why question of why should I be a disciple maker, I've got another really short clip by uh, uh, Chan. What's, I'm sorry, I lost his. Francis Chan, thank you. If you'll go ahead and show that. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, is uh, you know, you, know you, just, you just Simon, Simon Says, says your pat head, your head, you know, so, okay, 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 you know, Simon, Simon said, said it. it. Um, um, it's just, it's just, it was a very simple, simple game, game, but it's so, but it's so weird, weird how, how in the in church, church, Jesus, Jesus says, says is a is totally, a totally different, different game. game. If Jesus, if Jesus says, says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You study it, you memorize it. You guys, you guys it, it, it doesn't make any sense. sense. A, lot a lot of things we do. We tell us, we tell us to go, go out and make disciples. And how many people in the church are actually, are actually making disciples? disciples. They, memorized they memorized it. it. You know, I, you tell, know, I my tell my daughter, daughter hey, 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 Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. You said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say, I can it, in say it in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> am, 
my friends, my friends are, are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would, what it would look, look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she, knows she knows better, better, better than, that. than that. And so why, and so do, we why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and, and quote, quote everything, everything that he said? That he said. Talk about, talk about how much we know. know. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just this black and white stuff. stuff. If, if I just started with scripture, with scripture I'd go, here's what, here's I, would what I would do. I would start, making, start disciples. making disciples. Interesting. Interesting. And he was talking about me. For the last, probably for 15 years of my membership here, I was very content to memorize what this book said. I was very content to be diligent to study this. I was very content to understand the hermeneutic principles of how to interpret this book and look to other passages of how it was used and make sure that we're using major content areas where that's the topic to interpret those passages, not secondary. I wanted to know those Greek words. I even started trying to learn the Greek alphabet. I put it on PowerPoint slides. <laughs> what did God ask me to do? Yes, I need to memorize his word. But he said, go. <laughs> go and make disciples. Not memorize the Greek. <laughs> The main reason that we should be disciple makers is because of the master of our souls has commanded us to do so. We are not to be hearers only of the word, but doers of the word. There is nothing more sobering than to know that someone is watching you and to realize that you're modeling living Christ before them. This is how we're to continue our own growth and prevent spiritual stagnation. It's been said before that if we are if we're not actively making disciples, then we will necessarily stunt our growth. I'm not sure exactly how much of that is true, but I know if, when I understand my wife is modeling how I live Christ before her, for children, your own or others, they're seeing Christ lived in you. You're connected with someone in a relationship where you get together regularly and openly and honestly discuss where, how did this week go in living for Christ. That changes things. That calls me to a different level in my commitment, in my life as a Christian. So, a couple of other questions. Why this push on disciple making? Why can't things just be like they used to be? The short answer is that our mission field has changed. That's as simple as I can boil it down to. According to an article in Christianity Today, the June 2015 issue, most churches in America are small with a median attendance of 76 people. The fact that most Americans do not attend church today causes us to question so if size isn't our measure of success, what should be? How do we measure success now that most people don't come to church? The noses and nickels approach can be dramatically impacted depending on whether our culture agrees or disagrees that everyone should attend church. I'm not against tracking attendance at all, but should it be our measurement of success? Matter of fact, if, if I'm just content with saying uh, we want to measure how much we're giving and how many people attended uh, on Sunday, that may require very little of me at all. It certainly wouldn't require me to lay down my life for my neighbor. Today, many Americans are disciples of consumerism rather than disciples of Christ. And I think God is much more concerned with how we demonstrate we love him, that is, how well we keep his commandments. I would suggest that we measure our success the way God will measure our success when we stand before him. 
When we stand before God, we will be judged according to how well we kept his commandments. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, 22, verses 37 and through 39, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I believe we will be judged on how well we executed the mission of God, found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. If we measure our success by how well I've kept God's commands and how well I'm making disciples, this requires much more of me. It will require me to lay down my life for my neighbor, to give up my preferences, being misunderstood, being mistreated, all in the name of the gospel so that others will literally see Christ living in me. So what are we supposed to do? We've heard about making disciples for over five years. Some of us have engaged in that endeavor and sometimes the relationship stops or sometimes people move and so some of us have made an attempt and others still haven't yet. So what are we supposed to do? Well, beginning next month, we're going to expand our life group leaders meeting to include everyone who wants to become better at making disciples. The name will change to Disciple Making 101, trying to keep it simple. This discipleship training is for me. This discipleship training is for you. Whether you've been making disciples or not, this discipleship training is where we need to be. So beginning Saturday, September the 20th, 20th, we will meet once a month beginning at 8.30 in room 136 to focus on how we become better disciple makers. And right now you may be saying, my goodness, how am I going to fit Saturday into my schedule? The question that has haunted me this week is how am I not going to and stand before my master? I have to make some sacrifices. I have to make some priority changes. And this isn't one of those things that if you're not here, you're not holy. This is people gathering together to figure out how do we encourage one another in doing the things that we've read and studied about for decades. How do we put that into practice? I believe we're standing at a crossroads today. Every Christian has a decision to make. Am I going to be content coasting through life here on this earth with a veneer of Christian commitment or am I going to commit my life to radical obedience, to loving my neighbor in a self-sacrificing way, to spreading the good news of the gospel and to share my life with someone so they'll know what living for Christ looks like? This is our call. This isn't anything new. This is what Jesus and the disciples were doing in their times. It's the call upon our lives in our times. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the conviction that it brings when there's some changes that need to be in our lives. I thank you for pastor's leadership and all of the things that we've talked about in, in the past 10 years, the things that we've done, the things that are more a part of our lives congregationally. And Father, I thank you for the growth that we've experienced in wanting to be more outward focused to knowing that we need to be, using our facility, inviting others in, wanting to welcome them as if we anticipated their arrival. And Father, I know in my life, there's an area where I still need a lot of work. And that is loving others with the kind of love that you've loved me with. That caused you to send your son and caused him to die for all who would believe. 
Father, that kind of love can only come from your spirit. It can only come from you. So I pray as we contemplate this call to go and to be your witnesses and to make disciples, I pray that you would help us to be committed to be doers of your word. Help us to engage in something that can help us be accountable and help us learn and help us share conversations with each other about how well things have gone in our efforts. Help us to lay down our lives as you have laid down yours for us. In Jesus' name.